Please join me in welcoming to the stage our final panelists for today for a discussion on the topic of crowdfunding. Mary E. Jetton, founder, tracklight.com. Larry Spellhog, district director, SCORE. Ditto Nowakowski, founder, CanCan. Dan Shapiro, chief turtle officer, Robot Turtles. And your moderator, Tom Cock, founder, Vestory. Hi, I'm Ditto Novakoski, and I invented CanCan. -Can. This is my game. It's a puzzle building game where you use multicolored tiles on a black velvet game board and you build by matching color. And at the end, you've created a unique work of art every time. I went around and talked to people about, about the idea and got some support for it at the time, but there wasn't the sort of electronic or computer infrastructure to make it easy to happen. So it wasn't until about five years ago when my son said to me, Mom, you need to market that game. I started to consider Kickstarter. At first it was just too daunting to consider it. I didn't know what to do, but I talked to people and learned how to put my story together. I had two Kickstarter campaigns actually. The first one, I asked for way too much money and didn't succeed. The second one, I had learned from the first one and had gotten much more realistic about what I could expect to um, generate, and I got it. Then I got a matching loan from Community Capital Development, and Roland, he really went to bat for me to get this loan, and I got my first thousand games manufactured, and it was very exciting. I kept everybody at Kickstarter and on Facebook up to date. I have a thousand games now to bring to market and it's selling at the Seattle Art Museum, at the Bellevue Art Museum, a couple toy stores in town and Portland as well and we're expanding. I just sold a case to a store in Princeton, New Jersey. And we're growing. I'm Dan Shapiro. I started my career at Microsoft many years ago and worked at some big companies like Real Networks and Google. I took a leave of absence from Google for the summer to catch my breath and spend some time with my kids. While I was playing around with them, we invented a board game. It was called Robot Turtles. And the idea of Robot Turtles is that the kids are little programmers and they have instruction cards that they use to program their turtles. Since I had a little time before I had to go back to work, I decided to try something a little different with it. So I decided to put Robot Turtles on Kickstarter. The minimum factory order was a thousand units. So I'd have to find a way to get something to do with a thousand units other than put them in my garage. And the neat thing about Kickstarter is that you get the money up front so that you can go and know exactly how many units you're going to build. You don't have to try and forecast demand. When I put it up, I was really nervous about whether or not I was going to make my minimum and get to make the game. Well, I hit the minimum in the first five hours. By the time the 25 days were done, I'd sold 24 tons of robot turtles. That was pretty overwhelming. In total, I raised $631,000, 25 times what I'd set out to do. Now, here I sit, uh, a month and a half away from my delivery date. Everything looks good, and my attention is 100% focused on figuring out how to deliver these 24 tons of board games to 65 different countries and try and get as many as possible delivered in time for the holidays. It is exhilarating. Well done. Well done. We're looking forward to hearing more about the success stories. Uh, but before we get to those, maybe we should start with you, Mary, a little bit about where, where all this crowdfunding is a kind of relatively new thing, right? And so where does, and, and there's some moving parts even today. So maybe you could tell us where this all, the Jobs Act, where this sort of comes from. Sure. So crowdfunding started with the Indiegogos and the Kickstarters, and that was before the Jobs Act. And the Jobs Act is Jumpstart Our Business Startups uh, Act. And so the Jobs Act went into effect or was signed in April of last year. And the type of crowdfunding that it's going to allow is different from what Dan and 
ditto have done in that you won't be getting a board game or getting anything like that. Instead, you, you would actually be getting a piece of somebody's company. So that's the big difference. So you have rewards base, so that's Indiegogo, Kickstarter, Rocket Hub, and then you have what will be equity crowdfunding, which will be kind of the same approach. You'll have platforms that are online where you'll go and you will put the information about your company and then somebody will come and buy a piece of your company, essentially. And so where are those, what web, if somebody's here today says, where, where do I go, where do I start with all this if I want to sell a piece of my company and get, get some of that money coming in? You don't, Okay. Tom. Well. <laughs> You Unless can't. you yeah. really like orange, because it's you can't yet. Um, it's although the law is passed, it's not yet legal to do this. The SEC a couple of weeks ago came out with the proposed rules around the Jobs Act um, crowdfunding, and those rules are 585 pages, and there are. And we're only going to go through the first 300 today, <laughs> yes. right? Okay. So Just everyone get sure. turn their books to no. Um, there are 200, I think, and 292 something questions in there that the SEC has put out for comment. So the process is once those rules, once they receive the comments back, they'll take a few months, hopefully they'll finalize the rules, and then the some thousand crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding portals that are out there waiting. 1,000. There's probably over 1,000. Wow. wow. Um, that are waiting will be able to actually start receiving clients. And, and Dan, you have been in, as people saw, a wide variety, big business, small business. All up and down. Yeah, yes. I mean, all over the place. And now you've been through something pretty unique here. Tell us maybe a little bit about your experience and when you look at your whole business experience, how does this fit into all that? Yeah, when I first heard about Kickstarter, I didn't really get it. Why would you donate money to a company and maybe they'll send you something at some point? <laughs> and it didn't really make sense. And then I started having friends show up with cool things and they said, oh yeah, I found this on Kickstarter, it's really neat. And, and it kind of clicked into, into place for me that this was really interesting because it let people support something financially and cause it to exist that just wouldn't exist otherwise. So Kickstarter is full of projects that would not be created under normal channels. Um, that's not the only thing it's used for, but I'd say that's the most interesting because if you can get together a passion base of people, if you can get folks excited about something, you can collect the funds in advance that make it possible to deliver. And so that's what I wound up doing with Robot Turtles. I'm also really excited about um, the equity-based crowdfunding as another option. There's one, uh, just for completeness sake, it's worth mentioning, there are sites like AngelList where mm -hmm. accredited angel investors can find investments and make them online in denominations of like one to $25,000. Uh, but that's a whole different little ecosystem as compared to the doors wide open that we're about to see that you talked about. And that's about. the one big change that's going to become that you will not no longer have to be an accredited investor to write a check to get involved in one of those things. So let's maybe touch with you, Larry, because you're involved in all kinds of businesses and look at all this. Is this going to be an important part of small business? I mean, when you look at the whole spectrum of things, where is this going to fit in crowdfunding per se? Well, it's going to be another alternative for funding. Uh, startup businesses and young businesses, uh, I think th the, the likelihood of the equity-based funding smoothly in coming into the marketplace and revolutionizing financing for young companies is overstated. The, the requirements that a young company has if they're going to go the equity route is very extensive in terms of the disclosure that they have to make, uh, the fact that they first off have to create a Corp C legal structure so they can issue shares, and it has to be a Corp C, not a Corp S, not that it's that uh, big a difference. And what, they're, what the young entrepreneur or the new entrepreneur is going to have is an ongoing obligation to a set of lender or investors that uh, are going to take away from his or her ability to, to run their business. And I, I think we've got to wait to see how the final rules come out because I, I'm, I'm a, a little concerned that we're oversimplifying it in our minds and it's going to be much more complicated than it actually will be when it gets there. Ditto, you are an artist, a singer, and I mean, a creator. And we're talking about business here, so let's transition a little I bit. Know. But when people see your story, it's, it's fascinating that you've come. Tell us maybe just a little bit about your experience, because it may be a lot different than what some of the folks out here 
think of when they think of crowdfunding? Well, I think that's why I, I, I was excited to speak on this panel because um, what I love about crowdfunding is that the people like me who don't have a business background and don't and who just sort of do approach their business in a simple way, um, it's, the only, it's the only platform that someone like me who is not only an artist and not trained in business, but also asset free. Um, <laughs> I like that, asset use, free, you know, asset unencumbered. Therefore, therefore unencumbered do not qualify for <laughs> any of the normal um, loan packages. And it was only yeah. after my success on, on Kickstarter uh, and then talking with community capital development uh, with a long history of knowing Roland that, you know, that I was able to secure a very small business loan to sort of match my Kickstarter proceeds. And uh, without Kickstarter, I don't think I would have had the confidence to even go and ask, but also I wouldn't have had the success to show uh, in terms of the product. So. How long did it take you from start to finish to do the to get it set up and put all that out there on Kickstarter? Kickstarter? Yeah. How how long it was that? It took about three months to get the Kickstarter. How many hours? How, how much oh, time? Oh God, I don't know. A lot. I don't know. Three months. But okay. quite a few. I mean, yep. hours when you're when you're working on a creative project, you don't count them. Okay. Or I don't. Um, but also, I I'm not a workaholic. <laughs> So it wasn't that many hours, but it was a big learning curve because I had to do all the writing and then I had to make a video and that was, you know, nervous making. And, um, but I did it all and it was such a, it was so empowering mm -hmm. to, to just get it up there and then to, and then the other thing is my, the first day of my campaign happened on Hurricane Sandy. <laughs> So basically, I sent a letter out to everybody I knew saying, look, if you have any extra money, give it to the Sandy people. But if you have any extra from that. <laughs> extra, extra. You know? Yeah. And so it really, it was just a, it was, it was a hugely important experience for me. OK, so we've heard Kickstarter thrown. What's the best platform? What's the best? Anybody. Where, where's, where's the place to start with all this? The, the most money raised has been through Kickstarter. The most deals done has been through Kickstarter. Indiegogo's next. So that's the, they're the prototypical ones, but yeah. gosh, there's there 500 or 1,000 you can choose from. How come? Why has that been so, why is Kickstarter, why is that the, the place? They were the first ones, weren't they? Uh, Indiegogo was first, Kickstarter oh, yeah. was second. Yeah, Indiegogo. The, the big difference between the two, and full disclosure, my company's a partner with Indiegogo, not that I don't like Kickstarter, um, but with Indiegogo, they give you a choice between all or nothing for your campaign or keeping a, pro, a part of it, and Kickstarter is only all or nothing. So we, we always tell people when you're choosing your platform, make sure that you understand kind of do you need all of that money? If you're promising somebody 24,000 board games, if you don't get to your target, if you're on Indiegogo, are you going to be able to fulfill what your promise was? Because that's a big issue. Yeah. Doesn't Indiegogo offer both options? Now? Yes. Indiegogo's both. Kickstarter's all or nothing. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And so what sort of, I mean, for folks who are listening, what is the good, the bad, and the ugly? What projects work here? What projects don't work here? So in my, my experience, uh, both with my own project and with helping some friends um, do a variety of things from um, a book about uh, a photos from his great grandfather in World War I to a 3D iPhone accessory, um, the projects that work tend to have either a devoted loyal following already, where the project is where everybody comes together to go support their favorite cartoonist or go support their local bar that they are already patrons of. So it could be. So it could be. I mean, so you say bar and a car, I mean, those are a wide range of. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Um, so activating a community that already exists, or telling a story that's so compelling that it creates its own community around that story, and those are the things that I see really work. And give so, us a give us a compelling story. So. Um, Other than your own, of course. Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, we got we have, so uh, a great one was my friend who. Um, 
uh, inherited from his great-grandfather uh, a book of photos. And his great-grandfather was a photographer for the German army in World War I. And it turns out there just aren't any new World War I photos. And these were actually thousands from a professional photographer, went on to become a Hollywood um, uh, uh, cinematographer, moved to the US and immigrated afterwards. And it's the most just moving, touching pieces as you sort of see his, his growth from you know, a young soldier who is eager to, uh, to head to the front to the horror and tragedy of the war and its ultimate conclusion. Um, and this is something, if you took it to a publisher, they'd say, what do you mean you want to do a book of photos, World War I? You want to charge $70 for it and have it be this big? Like, this was just kind of crazy as a traditional publishing project. But when you put it out there, it turns out that there are a lot of people who are really passionate about history and who want to fill in the gaps and want to have some connection to these things that happened so many years ago. And so not only did he sell $100,000 worth of this book, but he's now talking with various TV and media production companies about taking this further and about taking this story and telling it on a much larger stage. So that's something that doesn't work so well as a traditional project, but works really well as an engaging narrative to go bring, an, uh, bring a group together to, to rally around a cause and bring it into being. And Mary, what crashes and burns here? What just doesn't work in this environment? Well, I don't think I don't think it. Oh, sorry, you said Larry or Mary? I said Mary, but you go right ahead. <laughs> you got an arm wrestle later, so <laughs> I have an opinion too <laughs> on that topic. Um, I don't think it's as much what works and what doesn't work. I think it's it's building the crowd first. So we have a uh, we're in an incubator. Our company's in an incubator in Phoenix, Arizona, and we have a fellow client, and he has a really cool product. It's called DNA on a shirt. So he takes DNA and then he makes art, and he has a patent pending process for doing this. So he did his first campaign, and it was a big failure on Indiegogo. And he's just completed a second successful campaign. So same company, same t-shirt. But he got um, the Cheetah Foundation involved. He did a lot of pre-work. And uh, that's really important, building a crowd. That's why you know we laugh about how many different platforms there are or will be for on the equity side. It's all about finding that cause and finding the crowd. So if you can find those people who are going to believe in you, that's what makes it work. You wanted to jump in, Larry. We're just yeah. giving you a little time no, just, here. If you're so. asking what doesn't work. Yes. Uh, the ones that, that we've seen, brick and mortar, retail, mm. the more traditional small businesses that you want to start and that have a high capital front end, uh, don't seem to work on that. The ones that are working, if you take the, the uh, list of the top 300 crowdfunding deals, the vast majority are video games and games in general. Technology's next. Um, watches. <laughs> watches, yes. Watches, yeah. 3D printers, and minimalist wallets. Yeah. Yes, minimalist be wallets. Dozen at any given time. Yeah, yeah. those are the ones the that do thing. work. I don't. Yeah. What would what would what would you do differently if you had to do it over again? Nothing. Nothing. I just the it, same way. I thought about it and thought about it. And I was like, that was easy. I don't even know how I did it, so <laughs> I I can't quite analyze how I would do it differently. Uh, I would do it more confidently, probably, mm. and quicker. Um, but uh, no, I don't think I would do it differently. I might, I might, I might try the equity style uh, soon, just to have some uh, uh, working capital. Working capital, okay. right? That's what they call it. Um, but I want to say what I really love about crowdfunding as an economic paradigm is that it resembles love. It resembles generosity, unlike most financial. Uh, platforms, formats. It's not a negotiation situation. You don't have to come, you know, you, you are just simply being unconditionally supported. And it is invaluable to a creative person or a, an inventor or, you know, or someone who's trying to build a business to feel that. And I think there's a shortage of that in our economic system. So I really feel like crowdfunding and things like it are very important models for the future going forward because poor people don't have access to capital, period, really. Um, and I, I would like to see more people who are like me, asset free, be able to um, receive support unconditionally 
th not unconditional. I mean, you have, to, you have to show great idea or you have to show great uh, incentive and great uh, perseverance and all kinds of things, but there really ought to be a niche for, for that because there's a lot of people out there who don't have assets mm -hmm. to back up a loan, a normal loan structure. Mm -hmm. So if, if I may jump in, there's one thing I've seen fail time and again on the crowdfunding sites, and it's so close to what you're saying, mm. but what you're saying is exactly what works. Mm. And the thing that I've seen that doesn't is when people look at an idea and they say, this idea is so great, it's going to sell itself. I'm going to put it on Kickstarter, and Kickstarter will bring people, and Kickstarter will bring the community, and it'll, it'll work through Kickstarter. And that's what falls over when, when people think that just the product, that just the idea is enough. Because it's not. It's the core. It's what pulls everything together. But the great Kickstarter successes are about either bringing your own community or about very quickly building that community out of a combination of positive word of mouth and great updates and bringing your friends in and you know trying to get press interested and doing all the sort of hustle that pulls it together. Whether um, whether it's you know whether you've been building that community for years like the you know like the comic artist or whether you've been building it for months because you've been putting this together. The, the, the product itself isn't enough. You can't just have a great idea. And what are some of the other misconceptions about crowdfunding then, big picture sense? What, what are the things that people think, oh, that's so obvious, but it's not? Yeah, so another one is that people think that they should put a store on Kickstarter. So they'll say, or, or Indiegogo, same problem. Here's the one unit, here's the two units, here's the three units, here's the one unit with the other thing, here's the one unit with the other thing and the two things, and then here's 20 different add-ons and pledges. People see that and they sort of feel like they're in a store. And I think Kickstarter actually wrote a blog. Uh, Kickstarter is not a store. <laughs> Kickstarter is not a store. And because the idea is you're fostering innovation. You're coming up yeah. with these really cool new things. So one, um, one thing that I always think of Kickstarter, Indiegogo, it's market validation. I mean, if you can get like someone right. like you, you put your game out there, you think, oh, okay, can I just sell a couple of these? And then you get 24,000. That's market validation. That's what you've received. So that is is um, you know having pitched angel investors before. They want to see traction. Mm -hmm. That's your traction. And so it's really, really helpful. And I just wanted to comment on what you said about the, the whole love and community. And you know I've pitched angel investors, and it feels like a negotiation from the beginning. Uh -huh. And that's not how you know, we've decided that's not how we're going to fund our company, because it doesn't make any sense to be working with somebody day in, day out, and interacting with them who doesn't believe in you. And I think that that's what crowdfunding really does. It, it gives you that confidence, like you said. And is this, is Larry, back to where, something you touched on, I think is absolutely critical to anybody who's out looking for money. This, it, from what you said, is a very small part of a large arena of places people can go get cash and if the equity part works correctly here. And some pl this may not work for many people that well, want that. this whole forum today presented dozens of different ways to, mm -hmm. for small businesses to raise money or find money. And uh, you know, I think that the, uh, the crowdfunding is going to be only one of them. I think it's going to have significant import, but I think the equity one is still, uh, the jury's still out in terms of what the details are going to be, uh, both on the investor side and the, uh, uh, the issuer side. Professional investors assume that when they make an investment, these are angels or VCs, that one out of five deals are going to make it, and four aren't. But when we go out to crowdfund for equity and we have non-accredited investors, how many deals are they prepared to, to invest in before they hit the home run? And I don't think that they understand that, that the law of averages is not in their favor when they go invest in an equity round. It's a long shot. It's a long shot. Is that fair? Yeah. Oh, I think it's I think it's fair. I think it's a fair observation, and the Jobs Act actually directly addresses the need for education mm -hmm. for in investors. And I was at a crowdfunding boot camp not too long ago in in Las Vegas, where a woman from the UK who runs their crowdfunding, and they have equity crowdfunding that's legal over there, and she said it was an interesting quote: "Wealth is not a skill set." It doesn't, just because you're wealthy and you're accredited, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're smarter than somebody I can give you many examples of that if you'd like. That's yeah. really true. So, yes. I, well, I don't disagree, first of all, if you read, you don't have to read the 585 
um, pages. That's why you're here. <laughs> you know, we, there's about 10 disclosures in, that were required in the JOBS Act, and you can just go down having audited financial statements if you're raising over 100, uh, sorry, over 500,000. You have to disclose a valuation. There's a lot of serious things in there for equity crowdfunding, so it's not as easy, not that belittling the process for Kickstarter and Indiegogo. It's not as easy as rewards-based crowdfunding, uh, but certainly the idea of an education for both investors and issuers is something that is being dealt with yeah. in the rules. As, as a frequent uh, angel investor, I will say that if I get one in five wins, I'm delirious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one in 10 is, is typically more, uh, more common, but oh, if, you, oh, if you were to stack rank in terms of um, the burden on you as the business owner, I would say, um, by far, the, so you start out with being a publicly traded company and all the regulations that come with that and SEC oversight. Right below that is going to be equity crowdfunding, mm -hmm. selling shares of your company. And in fact, the wow. SEC is modeling the regulations for equity crowdfunding on a simplified version of what pub public companies have to do with regular audits mm -hmm. and disclosures and this and that and the other. Um, then the next step down from that is a venture capital firm. The next step down from that is going to be professional angel investors. So the venture capital firm will have many requirements, but not as many as the SEC. And the angel investors will have some smaller number of, you know, keep us up to date. Mm -hmm. And then you get down to, you know, family and friends who are going to give you hell over Thanksgiving dinner. And the very bottom of the list is rewards-based crowdfunding, where your email inbox may be full of nasty notes, but at the end of the day, you're only... Uh, legal obligation is to deliver what you said you were going to deliver, and nobody has any right to tell you how it's going to happen or any right to information mm -hmm. in the interim. Oh, by, by the, by way, the way, you just, should share a lot in the interim. <laughs> I think that's very well put, but the, the, for anyone who wants to make one of these investments, just because you have all that information doesn't make it easier to pick the right company, correct? Yeah, right. Exactly. And we've seen that at the public traded level, too. Yeah. Yeah. And so that there, there's the rub of it. So give us some of the, we're going to take some questions here, great campaigns you've seen. What are some of the ones that have been Wow, it have been the wow factor. Any, anybody come to mind? Any? Well, other than uh, yours did, of course. But <laughs> thank you. I'm just trying to think of others. The famous one, of course, is the Pebble. Oh, you had there you go. Watch. We're you getting go. it at this moment, yes. <laughs> yeah, you went for $100,000 and ended up raising $10.6 million. Wow. Yeah. But that's an interesting one because that was one where really the fulfillment wasn't really thought through and there was some challenges. Oh, not, not at that scale. Yeah, yeah, not at that scale. So, yeah. you know, incredible success story yeah. now, but that's one of those things where you, you know, you, you be careful what you wish for. Right. Yeah. Um, How many did they end up producing? I mean, what were uh, they raised a lot. 10 million and it was about 100 bucks a pop. Oh, okay. 167,000 yeah, units or something right. like that. Yeah. And they had really had planned on like 10,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incidentally, the company, Pebble, was a part of the extremely prestigious Y Combinator uh, Accelerator Program right. and was one of the very few out of their group that did not get funded. All the VCs passed. Uh, they weren't able to raise enough capital to do it. And they turned to Kickstarter in some degree of desperation. Um, many of the folks involved told them that it was foolish and it was kind of amazing. They were yeah. one of the mm -hmm. first ones out there to really show the power of that platform. So sometimes the investment professionals can have it wrong, is what you're saying? Frequently. Oh, okay. And, and now I'm being facetious there. Frequently. 90% of facetious. the time, in fact, I would say. <laughs> and now they're VC funded. Oh, yeah. And yeah, now there's no that. shortage of people yeah. want to back them. And yeah. it's funny how that works. Um, typically, after somebody's had success in the crowdfunding platform, institutional investors are right there behind because at the end of the day, they're looking for measured risk. And once the demand's proven, the risk goes way down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and in Arizona, there's a company that does um, coffee. And I'm sitting up here, and I cannot miss no box. There we go. And they did a Kickstarter campaign just coming out of University of Arizona. They wouldn't have been able to start their company without the $12,000 that they raised. And so they were on Shark Tank, and they so it gave them street cred to move forward. Any indication on the equity side how big the money? And I mean, big? Will these be million dollar raises? People are. I mean, is there any? Well, the subject? maximum right maximum now is one million. Okay. And then there's a, a break point at a hundred thousand because okay. under a hundred thousand you can self certify your financial statements. So you don't need audited financials. You don't need like reviewed Dan was or, talking about. or audited. Um, so there was a lot of talk last year before the rules came out about it being something where a lot of people would try to raise 50,000, just the amount of money that they needed once and then you know, be able to create their company. Or annually. 
you can redo it. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, you yeah. can. Yeah. But yeah. the idea would be that some people just need that fifty thousand to get them going, and then they can be self-sustaining, and they don't have to go back. Larry, easier just to go get a bank loan. Uh, if you're <laughs> asset free. If you're yeah. asset free, <laughs> no. it gets very difficult. Right. Um, Without collateral of some yeah. kind. And startups in general, young companies have a difficult time raising money because usually they're comprised of young people that uh, that don't have the, the collateral, for instance, and you know, the, the, and the credit history, you know, the three C's of credit and all of that. So banks are not a good source. So it, it really does rely on friends and family and, and angels and angel networks and and uh, different kind of networking groups of all sorts to uh, to, to find money for these young. If, if I can do another companies. another stack, please. Um, loans must be paid back in a timely fashion mm -hmm. right. on a schedule with interest. Um, family and friends probably should be paid back. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Uh, equity. Um, when you sell shares, whether it's equity right. crowdfunding or to an angel investor or even to a venture capitalist, there's a significant expectation. Uh, they hope not, that they're not going to get their money back. They understand they own a piece of your company and your company may fail. The important thing being you can do with that revenue, what, uh, sorry, not revenue, you can do with those dollars whatever is best to grow your company without worrying about how you're going to pay it back in the near term. And finally, with rewards-based crowdfunding, uh, your only obligation is to deliver the product. That's not an investment. That's not a loan. It's a sale. That's right. And you should think of it that way. So right. you've got their money in advance of delivering the product. And if you can deliver the product for half of your expected cost, you get to keep everything in the middle. That's you need to put it in your pocket yep. or put it back into your business. On the flip side, if you don't do it right and it turns out to cost you much more, that obligation's on you, even though you didn't raise enough money to cover it. Mm -hmm. so. And you may go back and ask for more, is what you're saying, maybe? I... We're not we're here to put you on the spot. I you can... may, I don't know. I, haven't, I really haven't... Um... I haven't formulated that thought. I'm interested in expanding my network through selling the product right now, so I'm having fun with that and um, seeing where that takes me. But yeah, ca I can see the use of capital, definitely. I still have a day job, paint houses. <laughs> so. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>